Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Alan Reed. I'm Director of Client Projects with, uh, with HeartSquare, um, and I'm delighted to be chairing our, uh, our webinar and panel discussion today. Uh, the topic is modern education delivery for membership bodies. Um, and from the pre-registration questions uh, and the roles of the, the people in the, uh, in the audience, um, the, uh, the tone of what we've got today is uh, a lot of uh, people in a peer position in, uh, in membership organizations with, a, with an educating role. Um, and we're going to have a very frank and open discussion about the challenges, uh, uh, the opportunities, and what others have done to solve uh, some of the problems. Um, and then I'd like to have a, a conversation about uh, looking to the future as well uh, as part of uh, today's webinar. So um, I'd like to, first of all, uh, welcome our panel uh, to the discussion today. Uh, and if you don't mind, panel, I'm going to ask you to uh, introduce yourselves just briefly. So I I'm, I'm guess I'm going to ask you to take yourselves off mute, if that's OK. Um, and then, Jackie, do you mind uh, kicking us off? Morning, everyone. My name is Jackie Martin. I'm the Head of Education and Lifelong Learning at the Association for Project Management. Fantastic, Jackie. Thank you. And, and Sally, please. Hello, I'm Dr. Sally Gosling. I'm Director of Education at the College of Optometrists. Great, and Sukjit, please. Morning, everybody. I'm Sukjit Grohl. I'm the Director of Professional Development and Membership, Chartered Institute of Public Relations. Fantastic. Okay, great. And I, may I say from Heart Square, we're, we're uh, extremely grateful to the panel uh, to be making the time today. So thank you all uh, very much. So great. I'll uh, I'll just get started on the uh, on the agenda. Uh, so uh, first of all, just a little bit of webinar etiquette. We are uh, recording uh, this session. Uh, none of your personal data is being uh, recorded um, and things like the poll responses um, and Q&A questions are anonymous. Uh, so please don't worry about that. Um, on the Q&A questions, uh, there's an opportunity to ask the panel your own questions about your own challenges uh, and your own uh, projects. So you, you can see a Q&A box uh, as part of Zoom. Uh, please type your Q&A questions at any time uh, during, uh, during the, the webinar, um, and then we'll, uh, we'll have a Q&A session um, at the end. If you're having any technical difficulties, uh, there's a separate box at the bottom for chat. Please put um, uh, any questions in there on technical issues, uh, and then one of uh, my colleagues at HeartSquare will, uh, will, will help you. Um, so great, let's, uh, let's carry on. Uh, so, um, HeartSquare, I'll just, uh, 10 seconds, uh, I'll just say that we, uh, we specialise um, in education uh, within, the, within the membership space, uh, as well as working with, uh, with, with other types of non-profits. Uh, my own personal background is very much in, in, in education and awarding bodies uh, and qualifications management, so it's a bit of a, a hobby of mine. You might not want to sit next to me in a restaurant, I'll go on about it all night. Um, the, um, and then finally, the only other thing I'll say is that uh, we're totally independent of any technology or provider, which we think is important when it comes to uh, talking to people about uh, their technology choices. Okay, so from there, uh, what we're doing at today's webinar, we're racing along, we've already done the first one. Um, I'll, I'll uh, set out the challenges which have come from um, our experience of a lot of projects, but also the pre-registration questions um, and, uh, and our own uh, research, so what the state of the nation is um, at the moment um, in terms of membership and education. Um, and then I'd like to get as quickly as possible into the panel session um, and then your own Q&A uh, questions. So please don't forget to plug in your Q&A questions about your own uh, challenges. Okay, um, and then uh, from there then, uh, what we are seeing um, across uh, education and membership um, at the moment, first of all, uh, we're seeing that expectations haven't really been met. Um, 
going back to uh, 2014, I remember this really well, um, Andrew Hall was saying in a few short years, education will be digital, paperless and seamless, um, he, he said uh, back then. Uh, and he said it in good faith and, and seeing what was coming, um, et cetera, that that was happening in the great majority of the world and in the great majority of delivery uh, between uh, customers of various kinds and suppliers of various kinds. Uh, but the reality that we are seeing is that membership and, and particularly the education side of membership hasn't been able to deliver uh, to that promise. Um, and there are a whole series of reasons around that. One of them being that education is genuinely complicated and genuinely specialized in many, uh, in, in many aspects. Um, and it's not quite as simple as, uh, as managing a, a, an annual membership card. So uh, there is a gap between where we thought we'd be about now um, and where we are uh, about now. Um, so uh, and what we're finding is that it's not just a, a technology problem. Um, as I've said, you know, education is specialized. Uh, there are a whole series of verticals of functionality. Uh, there are a whole series of terms from uh, LMS system, which have elastic meanings uh, for different organizations, uh, to suppliers who think uh, uh, assessments are just an event with a questionnaire at the end, um, to remote invigilation challenges, uh, to uh, multiple marking challenges, and how to get uh, exams in, in front of uh, in front of the right people. Uh, we're also then finding uh, with all of these specialized and sometimes vertical areas of functionality that um, all of your stakeholders, your students, and, and uh, in some cases examiners, assessors, they don't care about any of that. Um, they don't care about the different departments you have between you. Uh, they don't care about the different systems that you have to use to do everything. Uh, they expect everything to be pretty joined up, uh, pretty immediate um, and pretty seamless. So um, a way of illustrating that uh, that we've seen, the director of education's view of the world, this slightly grumpy looking person um, with a lot of responsibility um, on his shoulders, uh, it's a he in this case, um, this person might have to manage uh, all of these different functional areas in order to, uh, to manage professional development, continual learning, um, assessments and so on. Um, and the challenge with all of that is that it's generally pretty poorly supported uh, by CRM systems, by website systems, uh, by, uh, by membership systems, unless they're pretty specialized. Um, so what this person can end up with um, is, uh, is, is a whole rat's nest of, of different data sources, um, different things that aren't talking to each other very much, um, and all sorts of challenges in getting an overview of a person and a student um, and being able to deliver a, a seamless experience to that person. At the same time, uh, so that what that person is able to de deliver uh, is often very disconnected um, and with a strong, dis a strong dependency on manual working, um, manual reconciliation um, and, uh, and, and uh, you know, the knowledge between people's ears. What we're also seeing, of course, uh, is that the student's view of the world then is that their membership body looks old fashioned. Um, there are other competitors to their membership body when it comes to uh, getting education qualifications um, and community, of course. Um, the, uh, the membership body is often very inflexible in how it works. So um, essentially, um, we have a, a disconnect. We have a, a mismatch between what uh, students uh, and, and other stakeholders are expecting um, and what the membership body and the educating body um, is able to deliver in terms of education um, and um, professional development alongside uh, alongside membership. So uh, the question then becomes uh, where do we go from here, uh, which is I hope a, a natural segue uh, to uh, talking to um, talking to our panel. So um, I'd like to um, uh, welcome the panel back um, to the to the webinar, um, and I'd like to start, um, if I may, by asking each panelist uh, just to give a little bit of an overview of uh, your organisation and what it delivers to people in in the context of learning and and professional development, because I think that's a good way of getting an understanding of your challenges uh, as well. Um, so if I could start off um, with you, uh, going from left to right, Jackie, if you don't mind, uh, if you could start us off with that, please. 
Sure. So um, the Association for Project Management, um, we are a membership organization. And within uh, my, my remit and, and my department, then we offer a range of qualifications for project managers from early stage in a career just starting out through to chartership as the chartered body. We also offer CPD to support across all of those stages of the career. And then alongside all of that, I think that the, what is now very common, the webinars, events that support that CPD side of things, as well as online learning, um, journals and publications. And we have quite an active schools and university engagement program as well to, to really try and, and work with those early career adopters once they're starting to make their decisions about where they go forward. So we really cover um, education, training and learning from very early stages through to sort of quite experienced stages in their career. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that, Jackie. Um, Sally, do you mind if I ask you uh, the same question then, please? Great, yes, thank you. So the College of Optometrists is the UK professional body for optometry. Um, we have about 17,000 members um, and our members are subject to statutory regulation by the General Optical Council. Um, the college provides the primary way in which individuals, so optometry graduates, enter the optometry profession and secure GUC regulation. So the, the route that we offer takes the form of a, a work-based assessment route um, or the scheme for registration, as we call it, um, which we deliver under accreditation from the, from the, the regulator, the GUC. Um, in addition to that, we also provide um, the final assessment for optometrists to secure independent prescribing rights. Uh, we offer a range of higher qualifications, which effectively form the blueprint for universities to deliver um, a range of post registration postgraduate level courses or modules in specialist areas of, of clinical practice. And then we provide a, a wide range of CPD provision, primarily um, online uh, prior to lockdown, as, as, as well as um, expanding that, um, and a range of educational materials that, that meet the current uh, statutory requirements for continuing education that our members are subject to. Um, and then we also offer um, much broader member engagement activity, um, but also an opportunity for members to secure um, fellowship by portfolio. So that's giving recognition to their professional development in their career and practice um, after a significant um, experience. So similar to Jackie, we offer quite a breadth and uh, quite a, a range of activity, both formalized and, and subject to regulation, but also um, uh, broader areas of development. Great, thank you very much for that, Sally. And, and Subjit, do you mind the same, please? Of course, um, the CIPR, with the world's um, only chartered body in PR and professionals, so we're really committed to professional development and lifelong learning. Um, so we really support the careers of our members um, from the early stage all the way up to advanced stage, um, and also try and build the public's understanding of PR as a profession. Um, so I think the, really, the best way to summarise our provision in education terms is quite comprehensive. So first and foremost, I would say professional development is at the centre of everything we do. It's at the heart of everything we do. We really focus on three key areas. So first and foremost, when members join, they have an access to professional network, learning from their peers and understanding what's going on so they can grow informally um, by networking. And we also offer the largest CPD platform in the sector, and where over thousands of learning activities are often available often with no further cost. We also offer a professional accreditation scheme and that enables members to become accredited or ultimately individually chartered PR practice. That's really a strategic aim of the Institute to ensure more of our professionals become chartered. We also offer professional training. Um, as my colleagues mentioned, we use a variety of formats, be it webinars, podcasts, and we offer skills-based training. Um, originally was face-to-face, um, -face, but we'll talk a bit later about that and how we've transitioned. We also offer professional qualifications. We are effectively an awarding body and we work with delivery partners um, across the globe, so in the UK and abroad. And for example, recently, we've just introduced a new qualification, which is digital PR and digital comms. So it's very timely we're having this conversation at this moment in time. 
Great, thank you very much for that, uh, to, to all of you. Uh, so starting, um, starting off on a, on, on a question that we are asked all of the time, and it's, a, it's, it's of course uh, a, an elephant in the room um, at, at the moment. Uh, most of the membership and educating bodies that uh, we are working with are still struggling uh, with the adjustment to COVID um, and lockdown to greater and lesser extent. Uh, so we we worked with organisations, for instance, Royal Society of Medicine, where uh, they educate the whole of the NHS, you know, postgraduate education, um, but everything was on site. So delivering hundreds of courses a year in their beautiful offices of Wimpole Street um, and COVID completely decimated um, all of that. Uh, to other organisations that were uh, already significantly along the road to uh, digital anyway, um, and were, were, were less affected. Um, could I please ask, uh, it's one of the most key areas of interest to the audience, um, uh, how you were affected um, uh, by uh, COVID and, and, and lockdown um, and how you've adjusted. Um, so if I could just ask for a brief comment from, from each of you and I'll, I'll start in reverse order this time with, uh, with Sukjit, if you don't mind. So as you said, Alan, um, it's been a really disruptive period of time for many people in different sectors and um, professional bodies aren't immune to this. But I think specifically what we've done, we've helped transition our flagship um, training workshops which were delivered um, to thousands, um, which are generally in London and other city locations around the UK. We've really transitioned that to online learning. Um, so we now have um, effectively um, virtual training delivered the same content the same it's been amended to ensure engagement of learners so those training delegates who turn up still get the same quality but they do it from the facilities of their own house what we've also done is we mentioned I mentioned earlier about chartering individually we have a unique charter in a day approach and that's now gone wholeheartedly on virtual uh, and one of the positives we're seeing lots of interest internationally and from those people in the past who may have not considered going to be on three key areas, which is ethics, strategy and leadership. So that's been a real win for us. And we've kind of transitioned from face-to-face. -face, and when we do face-to-face -face individual charge assessments, we've seen a real interest in that. And finally, um, we work with partnerships and with our delivery partners, accredited teaching centers. Um, a lot of them already had a blended learning approach. So we've really just helped um, facilitate that. But really, we focus on the quality assurance area to the fact that even our quarterly exam boards are now all virtual. So in summary, um, in terms of quality assurance and awarding body perspective, we found the process actually more comprehensive uh, and, properly, and, and most probably strengthened. So it's a, a kind of a, a change for us all but we have transitioned, I feel, very, um, very usefully. That, that's great to hear. Thank you. Really interesting. Um, and then Sally, do you mind? Yes, yeah, so it's, I mean, I think probably would reflect um, broadly similar points to uh, those that Sukjit has, has just raised. I think we've um, certainly faced challenges, but it's also been a real opportunity to um, expedite the pace at which um, we've been able to make changes or um, consolidate what was already in place. So I suppose just to give a few examples with the scheme for registration that I mentioned, that is the route, um, uh, the primary UK route um, to registration as an optometrist, we had to move very rapidly um, an assessment regime that, that was wholly work-based and wholly face-to-face -to, -face, um, to something that could still enable um, safe trainee progression, safe assessment, even if individuals were um, losing their role, furloughed um, uh, and not in supervised practice for, for uh, certainly the first uh, lockdown period. I mean, we had to look at how we could deliver as much of the assessment of the scheme um, as was safely possible uh, remotely. Um, and we had to do all of that while still, uh, while securing or, or retaining uh, regulatory approval for what uh, we were doing. So we, we did some very intense work over the spring and early summer to achieve that shift, to be able to move to remote assessments, one-to-one -one assessments, um, where that was safe to do so from a patient care perspective. 
while also looking very carefully at where we needed to retain face-to-face -face assessment in order for, for, for the uh, due uh, robust assessment to take place and obviously doing that in a fully COVID compliant way. Um, so that certainly has generated lots of learning but I would say has also enabled us to sort of expedite uh, positive changes to the scheme. Um, we certainly developed new online provision to strengthen our support for trainees on the scheme um, and prospective trainees on the scheme and also to mitigate um, the reduction in, in hospital placements, for example, that, that were no longer available. Um, we also moved our independent prescribing exam to being fully online with re remote invigilation. So we, we did that again very swiftly um, and have run that now three times since May to enable optometrists to uh, secure independent prescribing rights and that, that certainly is in response to COVID speeding up the demand for independent prescribers within the profession to meet patient, key, patient care needs. So while also you know, compounding the difficulties of that, that throughput. So that's been a really interesting area. And then I suppose on the CPD front, much, uh, much of our provision was already online. So I think that's really enabled the value of that offer to be brought to the fore, things that had been run as regional events, face-to-face -face events have also been moved online. Um, part of our conference provision we've moved fully online. So I think it, it, it's enabled us to, to build on what was already very well established from a CPD front to make that our, our mainstream offer. And certainly again, we, we have very high levels of member participation in those elements. Likewise, as Sudhu said, we, we've worked strongly with universities in terms of how they can safely deliver what have been um, primarily face-to-face -face higher qualification provision to optimising vendor learning, use of e-learning, uh, safe use of, of remote assessment. Um, and we're working very strongly with universities to explore the learning they've achieved through um, moving to more fully online learning and, and how, that, how that can be shared with, with colleagues. Great, thank you very much. And, and then um, Jackie, please. Sure. So I think, um, as both Sukhjit and Sally have said, there's a lot of the variants we have in common here. We were in a in a reasonably good place to, to take a lot of things forward um, and transition to, to making things virtual online. Um, but other areas have, have proved more challenging. Um, we had a, a project in place at the time to develop a, an online qualifications platform and with an um, extraordinary amount of, of work from the team involved that was brought forward so we were able to go live with that most of our um, qualifications our assessments are, are written so we were able to roll that out uh, early summer which was fantastic because it did mean that we could although face-to-face -face papers had to stop we could carry on with some of those um, assessments so that's been that's been brilliant uh, in terms of online learning, we already had our, our learning platforms there in place, but then to support them, we have done a lot of work around really publicizing to members what's available and just reminding people of, of what we have and how packaging that. So it's a sort of really clear package for, for people to access easily. Um, also with events, obviously they have all changed. Um, there have been a very successful transition again to, to online for those, um, some running over a couple of weeks, some running for one or two days, um, as well as an increased webinar program, which was incredibly popular, especially during the summer period um, and the usual promotion of the events that we would normally do, but again, have all transitioned to become online. So. Things have changed, they are different, um, but I don't think it's been all bad. And I think there is a lot of learning that we will take forward from this. That's really interesting. So all three uh, organizations, um, all three of you have, have essentially uh, made a virtue out of a, of a necessity. Um, it, it sounds like all three organizations have actually realized some benefit, uh, you know, a real silver lining to uh, being forced to move to digital in all areas, um, uh, and perhaps at a, at a faster pace. Uh, you mentioned more international uh, take up of your qualifications uh, and, and courses, um, and Sally and, and Jackie the same, all, all, um, uh, all experiencing some benefit of, of the necessary change. Great, thank you. So, um, I can see uh, we're already getting uh, some Q&A questions through, so please do ask those. I'm just going to ask, uh, put up a quick poll 
um, to uh, to the delegates, please. Uh, so um, this is a poll um, uh, just asking, um, what are the main challenges for your organizational uh, delivery of education? Um, so um, if you could just, it's multiple choice, please uh, indicate the ones that are uh, the main challenges that you're experiencing. Um, and then um, we'll just give it a, a, a few seconds more. Uh, so uh, meeting everyone's expectations, uh, lack of investment, older or disconnected uh, systems. Um, and great, I will, um, I will then um, pause the, uh, the, the polling. Great. So, um, and in fact, if I share the results of that, um, what we can see is that a, a solid half uh, of the audience um, are experiencing older or disconnected systems being a part of the problem, which links to the fact that education is fairly specialized and, and uh, expectations are going up all of the time. Um, uh, a cor corresponding lack of investment is a, is a challenge around education. Um, responding properly online, uh, we see that being a difficulty uh, for a little over a third of the, uh, the audience. And of course, if your data is spread across lots and lots of different systems, it's very hard to represent your relationship online properly. Uh, websites, as we all know, are made of, uh, of good data. Um, and then there's a few, uh, there's a, about a quarter of the, uh, the audience who are not experiencing any of those problems. And I, I, I hope they're in, in enjoying that position. Okay, great. So let's carry on from there. Um, on, a, on a very pragmatic question, one of the key areas of interest for a lot of uh, the delegates uh, to the panel is um, what software do you actually use? What software and systems do you use in your organizations? Um, and people might be scribbling this as you, uh, as you reply. What do you use it for? And how well does it work for you? Uh, so if you don't mind um, giving us some thoughts on that, and I'll start with you, Sally, uh, if I may, on, on that question. Yes, sorry. Yes, we um, deliver our uh, online CPD provision using a learning management system through Learning Pool. Um, so we deliver, we build um, and deliver um, our CPD provision um, through that platform. Um, and we use it extensively for, and, and have a very regular um, production of, of new material um, and sort of recycling, repurposing of material to sort of really optimize its value and relevance to members. We use webinar software for delivering interactive sessions and that, that's again we've shifted that being studio based to, to being um, delivered remotely from wherever speakers are um, and we use um, similar software for interactive peer discussions. Um, for the independent prescribing exam we've uh, undertook a, a small tender exercise to um, find a uh, this required bespoke software in order to be able to deliver um, a sort of high stakes online exam that includes remote invigilation. Um, so that that's, um, I'm aware from what I told you saying, sort of highlighting the, the, the sort of range of platforms that we use to, to deliver um, what we need, which that's what you've said, Alan. Um, and then we've used more sort of generic common platforms, Zoom, Microsoft Teams, to deliver both one-to-one -one remote assessments but also informal sort of coffee morning sessions during the, the first lockdown, as well as evening seminars um, and, and using similar software for developing and, and producing podcasts for members. So quite a rich variety of, of more niche through to, to very uh, commonplace uh, platforms to optimize our offer. Thank you, Sally. And can I ask, uh, do you have issues with the stuff not quite talking to each other as well as you would like, or, or, is, or has that largely been resolved? Um, with uh, the college, I think those are ongoing issues. I don't think they've they've um, sort of there's they've probably been thrown into relief by COVID as opposed to um, you know, not being known about before. I think um, how we achieve a stronger integration of our whole CPD offer um, is something that we're certainly looking to do actively at the moment. So we have a number of publications that have a very strong CPD um, purpose to them. But they're not currently directly interlinked with our LMS system. 
Um, we don't currently have a portfolio based system for members, although we are developing that for, for particular parts of our offer. So I think, as you say, how that integration is achieved, um, we're, we're looking to develop um, a sort of recognition of members um, through CPD routes. So I think sort of how we achieve that integration over time is certainly a strong focus and how we sort of knit everything together. So I think it is a, a challenge still to be resolved while coming up with quite pragmatic you know, sort of short term solutions to, to optimize our delivery in the immediate term. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, and then uh, Subjit, uh, do you, would you mind um, uh, the same question, please? Yeah, uh, so very similar to what Sally was saying there, just to, to go over a few points. I think we were lucky in one way. Um, before COVID, we identified that we wanted an integrated approach. So in the past, we had a website sitting separately, a database sitting separately, um, a CPD platform sitting on another hosted um, site elsewhere. That's always a recipe for disaster. If one goes down, it has a knock-on effect on others. So what we actually did is we brought in um, an integrated system. So a CRM, which is web-based, we had an integrated CPD platform. Um, and just like Sally mentioned earlier, we've just used a variety of commonly available platforms. Um, so webinars, podcasts, there are um, market leading software. We've really done uh, the kind of due diligence by asking others in our networks um, to say, have you got experience in using this platform or the other? And I noticed one of the questions was asking that on the Q&A um, about what platform. We generally go with what's available and what's easily used. So for example, when we're using webinars, um, we understand that some of our feedback was certain employers don't use a type of platform. So we had to then think outside the box and then use a variety. So where we are at the moment, it's work in progress. We really do feel that the point you made earlier, Ellen and other colleagues about disconnected system, that's probably the one thing that we've learned through this process. If you can think and map out how your systems talk to each other, be it enrollment, be it content, be it um, delivery of certificates, all of that and assessment, we have the um, benefit of learning from others. So as I mentioned earlier, universities and teaching centers use different platforms. Some use Moodle, some use their own developed learning management systems. We're able to ask them, um, what are they learning? So I don't think it's a quick fix. I think what we'll find over the months and years to come is to find that balance. Um, but I think the one key thing for me at this stage is, perhaps if you focus too much on technology, the question always has to be, what does the end user want? and what do all stakeholders want? And the more time you spend with that, it's not a one size fit all. Um, so sorry for the cliches, but that's really where we want to get the thinking going. Great, thank you very much. Um, that's really helpful. And then uh, Jackie, do you mind commenting as well? Sure. So um, as, as both Sally and Subject said, we use some of the more commonly used platforms for uh, our, some of our interviews for assessments, so for our chartered interviews, for example, we're using um, more widely known software, but then we've also had to specialize for, for different offerings that we have. So one of the newer things we have is a community hub for our members. So for example, that we're using Hivebrite to deliver the hub for us. The online qualification, qualifications platform is uh, with Surpass. Um, and we're using in event for our events. These are all quite new to us. And obviously some things such as the events platform we've had to, to, to bring on board and, and get to learn very, very quickly. So they have offered different challenges. Um, that disconnection has posed issues and I'm sure we'll continue to do so. But I think a lot of this has been a, an outcome of having to react very quickly to these changes um, and, and make sure that we can keep our, our offerings ongoing for members. So I think we, we will get to the right place with them, but that there's still a way to go in some areas. Fantastic. Um, thank you very much for that. Um, we're, um, we're getting a lot of uh, Q&A Q questions for the panel, so that's great. I'm keen to get to that um, as soon as possible. And actually what we're seeing as well is a lot of the, the chat, people are listing the systems that they're using. Um, so please carry on with that. That's great. We can circulate that afterwards um, as well. Um, there's a there's there's a quite a, a range of systems that people are using. Um,
we might uh, excise some of the swear words that people have put against those systems um, and, uh, and, and let, let people know uh, whether they were happy or not. Great, so um, looking, um, looking more broadly, um, can I ask uh, the panel's view on um, whether, um, whether you're finding that uh, students, uh, delegates, uh, customers, uh, members, are expecting more from their membership body um, in recent years than the, than they have done in the past. Um, and are you able? Do you feel that your your own organisation is is able to meet the expectations of, of modern students and, and members, or do you feel there might be still a little bit of a gap there? Uh, and where might that gap be? Um, so I'll I'll open that one up to the panel um, generally, please. Anyone uh, would like to start us off with some comments around that? Can I can I come back to that? Yes, yeah, please. Um, Thank you. So, yeah. So on reflection, um, being being in the sector for over twenty years and working in very different um, areas such as healthcare, legal, and now PR and comms, one thing that is constant is the the needs and demands of members and and students going forward. So we've always had to be dynamic and understand and get feedback and rather than just getting feedback is acting on that so for example we launched our first virtual conference this year um, and that was really new for us and we didn't know what to expect we wanted to be brave we went out to the market we told everyone well in advance um, this is a new type of engagement and the feedback we got on, on social media and twitter in particular was fabulous so it does demonstrate that actually members are looking at new ways of working, new innovative ways. We've got feedback, for example, we have uh, increased demand for mentoring now. So we've launched uh, full member mentoring um, and also student mentoring. So what we're finding is it's one, ascertain what the needs are. Secondly, act on it quickly and then gauge the feedback as we go along. So overall, to answer your question, are people being more demanding? I think members are now engaging far more than they ever used to. Perhaps we had a silent majority of members in the past where we used to survey once a year, but now we're getting regular feedback. And the great thing for us, um, and I'm, uh, it'd be interesting to hear the other panelists' view, but we're getting so much more engagement to say, can you launch this product? Can you do this for us? And that's been seen in the increasing um, uptake of uh, more members coming and joining us. So our member recruitment is going up because we're providing more and more services and products. So that's been very positive for us. That's really interesting. Thank you. Um, Sally and uh, Jackie, if you don't mind, any comments? Yeah, I, I would agree. I think that the one big advantage from, from this is that it does enable us to engage much more widely than, than we have been able to before. So. Uh, we noticed with our, for example, with our webinars, um, the, the number of people registering and attending increased dramatically, um, but also for, for our events, you know, there's, there's also concern that people like to network, people want to be face-to-face. -face, and, and if you have to move something online, are people gonna be as, as interested and, and as keen to partake? But actually, yes, they have. The, the, the uptake for all of these things we've had to change has been incredible. People are very engaged and, and remain so. And I think having been in a position where we've had sort of community hub about to launch an online qualifications platform that was able to be produced early, we've been able to really sort of harness that as well and take people forward. And I think that there are areas where it's been slower and where we, we do need to do more work to, to improve in certain things. But on the whole, engagement has been very strong and our members really want to continue their learning and their education with us through this. That's really interesting. Thank you. Just to add a few comments uh, to what Jackie and Sujit have said. I mean, I think um, certainly we've found um, from a scheme perspective that um, Perhaps in a sense, expectations have have increased, but I think for very understandable reasons. But for the trainees we have um, on the scheme or new graduates waiting to to enter the scheme, it's a time of high uncertainty. 
in a way that probably the, the perception of the profession has never seen before, uh, or, or certainly not in recent years. So I think um, there's been higher expectations of perhaps regular communication, how, how communication happens, which we've certainly been seeking to address. Um, and certainly it's flagged up to us, we need to strengthen how we gain um, feedback from all stakeholders in, in how the, the scheme is delivered in, in challenging circumstances. Conversely, with CPD, um, we've we had very established arrangements for gaining member feedback on what we offer um, and, and, how, and, and use that very strongly to evaluate um, provision. Um, so we're looking at um, sort of cross-learning uh, between the two. I think one parallel issue that's certainly come up really strongly in the context of COVID is to be effective in how we um, progress our offer has um, very positively strengthened our stakeholder relationship. So not just with members, but how we work with universities, with employers, with other parts of the sector, we've really um, strengthened those stakeholder relationships and that, that's really enhanced and informed what we deliver. And I suppose the other element that, that certainly, I think recent um, activity has drawn out is how we, how we sort of provide that continuity of, of member support, member development and member recognition. Um, so certainly our new college strategy has a very strong focus on how we can give that sort of tangible, demonstrate that tangible value and impact to members um, and sort of re that in a sense, rebalancing the profile of what we offer from being the entry point to the profession to really supporting members once they have qualified um, in their ongoing lifelong learning career development. Um, so I think those, all of those things are sort of um, heightening individual member engagement and how we really show the benefit of that, but also, as I say, much stronger stakeholder collaboration. That, that's really interesting, Sally. Thank you. And that, that needs, leads us really neatly, in fact, uh, to talking about the future of education and, and membership. Um, and I'd like to ask the panel, if we project forward, let's say, three years, um, uh, we can hope that the, the pandemic, pandemic conditions will be, uh, will, will be over. Um, and, uh, but some things will not have changed. Uh, students will still be uh, demanding value for the money they spend. There'll still be competition from other uh, organizations uh, who may do nothing else but run this particular course or um, offer nothing else but some, some particular element of what you, uh, you do as part of your wider program. Uh, so could I ask, uh, projecting forward uh, over, let's say, the next three years, uh, what are your views for how things might change and the health of education and, and, and membership, uh, if, if you don't mind? I'll pick on someone at random, um, uh, Sukhjit, if you don't mind uh, your, your comments on that, please. It's an interesting one, and, and um, I, I think on reflection, it's probably too early to say, but I, I'm almost envisaging for the next 18 to say 12 to 18 months, um, more focus on um, virtual learning and access to that. Um, we can also factor in potential pent up demand for what we call skills-based training face-to-face. -face. So we are envisaging there will come a time where people will want to come out and learn um, and we will fully provide that. So we're not discarding traditional face-to-face -face, uh, learning opportunities. That's the first thing to say that we may be focusing on virtual platforms and delivery going forward. But if we are looking at two to three years down the road, what we're also finding is that actually there are certain areas of membership and membership engagement that we've listened to as well. One area we've acted on is how people are feeling so isolated now. The one thing that we're really focusing on is giving support networks. So for example, um, those people who are unfortunate um, and not having a role going forward, they will need skills to update their CV, interview skills, and believe it or not, doing a Zoom interview skill naturally. And that's not something that's common to everyone. So how do you prepare for that? So we've been listening to members. We've been preparing them, giving them um, support, guidance, ensuring that, that we meet their short, medium, and long-term needs. I do think it's going to be a mixed bag going forward. I do feel that, if anything, we will see more engagement in learning opportunities. And that's really, really crucial for us because at the CIPR, that's what we're here about, to develop people throughout their career and giving them a variety of engagement in learning and, and different platforms and different approaches. 
But at the same time, we're not discarding the fact that our flagship products of skills-based training, um, which are generally one day training, and then apply those skills the next day, there will be a demand for that. And we feel that we have to balance that demand at the moment, but at the same time, still keep investing uh, going forward. So uh, a kind of a mixed approach, but I do think that's vital. Great, great. Thank you very much for that. Um, Sally, do you mind uh, your, your thoughts on the same topic? Yeah, thank you. I mean, it is for optometry um, in the time frame that you've indicated that there's um, significant change afoot. Um, there's regulatory change that that um, is ongoing that um, is set to, to um, quite strongly uh, change how education and CPD um, are regulated uh, within the profession. Um, and there's also obviously significant ongoing change in healthcare and significant opportunity for the profession in those changes to, to contribute to meeting expanding need, unmet need um, in sustainable, affordable ways. So huge opportunity, um, but, but some challenges of what I think. So for me, I think key issues are um, supporting members in a way that demonstrates the real distinctive value for them as individuals. So uh, as one key example, the whole approach of CPD for the profession is, is due to, to change to what's more, much more aligned with other healthcare professions, but much more um, focused on individual professional responsibility and accountability for the outcomes of CPD activity, rather than uh, perhaps a focus on input of, of um, education. So that shift, I think, is a, is a real opportunity for the college to um, support members, give recognition to professional development in, in ways that I've alluded to, while also supporting them with quite a significant shift in, in how they demonstrate fulfillment of professional responsibility. Um, I think as well, rather than just looking at um, a professional body as a provider of education, it's very much developing the role and asserting the role of a professional body as the leader of, of a profession's development and, and therefore individual members' professional development. So how as an organisation, we influence the change that our members then experience and practice in and, and optimise um, individual opportunities within that. So I suppose going back to Sutjin's point, it's not just about um, not starting with the technologies of what can we do with the technology. It's absolutely about how do we use learning uh, technologies, technological advances to support what we need to develop deliver and develop um, as an organization. And I think stronger member engagement that is a, um, a blended approach rather than assuming it's all about virtual delivery is absolutely essential, particularly for a clinical profession, um, but also really supporting strongly engagement in a, a quite a rapidly moving healthcare and workforce transformation agenda in, in healthcare. So sort of definitely asserting the, the professional body's role, but doing that through quite strong collaboration with other stakeholders and making sure the relevance is really clear um, in terms of what we offer to, to member opportunity and member development. Thank you very much. And then uh, Jackie, uh, please, if you don't mind. Uh, I think that um, for us, it's about, as Sally and Sixtia have both said, it's, it's about what can we learn from where we are now and the changes we've had to make uh, without throwing out everything that happened before? And it's, it's finding that the right combination uh, to, to help the profession develop and move forward with all the challenges that everyone's now facing, particularly in terms of employment and the career market generally. Uh, so I think there needs to be a big focus on younger members as well and our schools and our university engagement and how we can best help them prepare for, for their careers. Um, but also I think we have to bear in mind that people have a choice certainly within my organization whether to, to belong or not, whether to be a member or not. So we want to be able to offer something that's different to, to what they might be able to get perhaps if they're within their own organization from their own employer. We, the world of CPD is huge. And most people, if they're working, have CPD, which is offered by their own employer. So it's being able to, to perhaps work with that, but then offer something extra as well to, to help members really benefit as much as they can from, from what, we can, what we can provide. 
Fantastic. That's that's really interesting. Um, so it's not all about the uh, all about the technology. Um, it, it it's about the, the culture and engagement with your your stakeholders. I think that was a common thread there. So thank you very much for that. We've got a whole bunch of Q and A questions. I'm very keen to get to. I'm just going to ask um, a uh, uh, a very quick polling question, um, if I may. Um, and I've, we've just created this in response to people's issues with uh, with disconnected systems with more than half of the delegates. You should be seeing a, a poll there. And so it's which questions, which statements apply to you. Um, if you could just get your thoughts on those, I'll give it another 10 seconds. Um, and then uh, we'll, uh, we'll share the results. Great. Uh, thank you very much, um, everybody. Um, so let me um, quickly share those results. Um, and what we're seeing here uh, on the results um, is that um, a, a minority, something under a third, are relatively happy with their systems with no plans to change. The majority um, plan, uh, just under a third, plan to change membership. Um, uh, a little over a third um, plan to change education and management, um, and actually uh, exactly half plan to change the website. And of course, we all know there's no such thing as standalone systems anymore, so that would be related to education and, uh, and membership change as well. So a lot of change um, uh, going on uh, in, uh, in, in the sector, uh, if, as represented by, uh, by the delegates there. So great, thank you very much for that, everybody. I'm going to ask my colleague uh, Rebecca, if you don't mind, could you um, could you uh, give us some of the Q and A questions for the for the panel? Uh, we haven't got time to get to all of them, so I might just ask one panelist uh, for some questions to go through, and then open some others up. So Rebecca, do you mind? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Alan. So actually, following on from um, Jackie's remarks just earlier, um, and not just looking at the tech, but also looking at what value um, membership bodies can offer questions come in. So what can membership organisations do to ensure that membership benefits offered are available to all, specifically for students from a lower income background and those students studying in Scotland where education is predominantly free? So delivering all of that without compromising on quality. Uh, I guess if we uh, direct that one to Jackie then, please. Yeah, good question. Um... We, for within our organization, we have free student membership. Um, and I think that's, I think that's a really good starting place in terms of being able to show how we can support people as they move through their careers, but also what we can offer students. And I am thinking particularly at the moment, for example, at university, um, by providing events within their own universities or more widely across a group of universities, um, networking opportunities uh, in conjunction with our, our volunteers who work very closely with us um, and really helping them to engage with people at those early stages who are already in the profession and understand more about what they need to do, where they need to go and to make those connections at those early stages. So I think that sort of provision that we can provide for our students free of charge at this early stage is, is perhaps one of the key things that we do. Great, thank you. Um, and I'll, I'm keen to get through some more questions. Uh, so do you mind, uh, Rebecca? Yeah, of course. So um, obviously we've heard a lot about um, successful moves to online learning from our panelists, but a question's coming about what advice would you give to a membership organization actually looking to introduce online learning for the very first time? Um, and I guess we'll just throw that open to anyone who's got any comments on that, if you don't mind. Yeah, so uh, if I can come back on that, um, I think we've already touched upon this, Alex. It's about understanding the culture um, and what the needs are. Sometimes we dive in to say, here's a solution, but we don't know what the problem is. So, for example, if online learning enables um, people to progress at their own pace, that's a real key driver. So that's why if you are interested and members are saying, look, I want to do this qualification or training, but I'm worried about fitting it in, working along a full-time job and whatever. So if we're able to provide flexibility, access, and then reassurance to say that there is a tutor uh, or access to a human, per a human being by direct contact, 
um, to set up feedback regularly, it's really important to understand how do you engage with people across the board. And I think that culture aspect is absolutely clear. Does it fit the strategy of the organization going forward? At the CIPR, we, we've kind of engaged a five-year plan. We want, to, we want to engage our members and tell them in advance where we want to get to. We see online learning as a way to enable people to become um, chartered, for example, or suitably qualified. So it's really understanding what your membership wants. Um, taking small steps first, try the webinars. We launched a series of webinars. We got a huge engagement with lots of webinars uh, and, and, mem and members doing that. So it's really just using that advice of saying, go slowly, be, be brave. Um, if you want to do something, trial it. And if it doesn't work, move on to a different approach. Great, thank you. Um, thank you very much for that. Um, and then Rebecca, next question, please. Yeah, sure. So um, I guess leading on from that, once you've uh, decided to move to online learning, the question's come in about how difficult has it been for you to get support for the right level of investment to modernize your systems? Um, great. And, and Sally, I, I guess, uh, if you don't mind me directing that one at, uh, at you, um, if you have any comments on that, that would be great. Um, I mean, it says at a sort of broad level, just building on what Jits has just said, I, th I suppose it, it, it's making a, a, a very robust business case for um, an approach that, that should um, meet member needs and, and therefore organisational needs in, in the um, very reasonable long term. So I think... Um, thinking through all the issues that has uh, have just been said, I think is hugely important. I think exploring the competition. I mean, I think um, as was a risk is assuming, as I think we've touched on throughout the session, um, a member organization perceiving it is um, with the lead provider or, or has that security of Romania lead provider when actually what it might be doing is better coordinating um, members awareness and, and access to existing provision that might be freely available. So I think it's that having a really strong strategic eye on what, what, what's going to give a good return on investment in terms of member recruitment and retention, rather than just looking at short-term things that might look um, attractive, but may, may be very expensive to, to sustain or, or, or may quickly become dated or um, outpaced in the market. So I suppose it's not an answer to, you know, where, where, how, do you, how do you secure the investment? But I think a very strategic tactical approach to how does it fit with the organization's vision for how it wants to grow and sustain its membership is probably absolutely fundamental and, and really look at, at its purpose within building that member engagement. Um, that's and that's really pragmatic advice, uh, absolutely, because education is an area where people do rush out and go shopping a bit um, or tactical solutions that then just add to the problem of, 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 of the a person's record split across lots of different places uh, and, and disconnected service as a result of that. Thank you. Um, and then Rebecca, is there a, uh, another question then please? Yeah, absolutely. So a question that's just come in actually. So um, looking with the move to online with COVID, it's obviously having huge environmental benefit with delegates and speakers no longer traveling. With environmental impact and carbon footprint becoming ever more important, what have you got in place to balance this with a return to attendance CPD and blended learning? So uh, this delegate saying that we already do electronic mailing and notes, but they're aware that there must be much more that they can do as well. Um, um, I think what I'll do is I'll just uh, throw that open for anyone who's mm -hmm. got any comments. But and just before then, we're we're coming up to nine thirty. I think we're just going to carry on beyond nine thirty if people are happy to stay on. And of course, if you're if you're if you've got your next meeting uh, and they're dragging you away, then of course that's perfectly understandable. We're going to circulate the Q&A questions um, and uh, we can keep the conversation going after the webinar. So um, so please, uh, environmental uh, footprint, and uh, I'll throw that one open to the panel then, please. Uh, yeah, I'm happy to start with that. Um, this is really relevant for us right now. Um, and it, there is there is a big drive um, from APM to to really, as I've sort of been saying, to, to keep up some of the work, the ways we've had to change and to really take these sort of new ways of working forward. Um, as a very specific example, one of the pieces of work I'm doing at the moment is we are reviewing our competence framework and working very closely with members and, and groups within the organization to find out what people want. 
And this uh, sustainability is clearly something people want included in the competence framework that's come through loud and clear. So we will be building that in as, as part of that, that piece of work, but just more generally across the, the qualifications and assessments, um, the training we do with our assessors, standardization training, that will continue online. I think this, we have proved that we can do this effectively just as well online as we can face to face. So, so where we can, we will continue with this way of working for, for these particular areas. We won't rule out face to face or together, but we will definitely reduce it. Definitely. That's really interesting. And, and Sally, uh, do, are you, do you have the same pressures and the same thoughts around that or, or uh, is, it, is it different in your own organisation? I mean, I suppose with, with our provision, much as Jackie's just said, we, we've um, obviously made some changes out of necessity, but we certainly um, can see the benefits of them, including from an environmental perspective um, and, and we plan to continue with, with those um, changes being in place, partly for, for, for that very reason. Um, I suppose as a as I've said, as a clinical profession, there are some elements that will have to remain face to face. But we, again, we're looking at how we, uh, for example, with our final exam, which is a clinical exam, uh, OSCE format, how we can um, create elements of that that reduce the need for face to face. So I think it, it, it's we're continuing to sort of build on learning again, draw on expertise from across relevant uh, sectors and, and from, from peers to look at how we can address these needs. And so I think it's it's a useful byproduct that again is sort of expediting change that's needed, but I think it's a really useful perspective to consider these issues from, but certainly we have far fewer um, travel um, activity on the part of assessors because they're able to do things successfully remotely. So it, it has that immediate benefit that we plan to retain. Great, thank you. And um, let's move to another question then, if we can. Uh, Rebecca, do you mind? Yeah, absolutely. So um, we've got a few about, you know, once you start bringing a new technology or online learning system, so um, the questions come in. The positive opportunities um, this has provided has highlighted several areas of difficulty on the internal and external member IT skills and their development. So how has the panel found sort of preparing learners and staff for this move to online learning. Um, and I'll throw that one open, please. I mean, it's just, just from a college perspective, we've certainly um, invested time in supporting our um, assessors to engage with remote visits. So it's probably been more um, needing to address that than um, young trainees, uh, you know, recent graduates who are perhaps much more experienced with, with using online formats. So I suppose it's something, it hasn't been a huge issue for us, but it's certainly something that we've um, given strong consideration to and addressed. And again, going back to an earlier question, we've certainly considered those issues from an equality, diversity and inclusion perspective are we making presumptions that are not appropriate in terms of access to technology? So certainly those kinds of things we're, we're, we're using to, to factor into our approach and to sort of um, check our expectations to ensure that they, they are fair and inclusive. I think we, we, we are looking at those issues from both of those perspectives. Yeah, so, we've been... Thanks. Sorry, yeah. Uh, do carry on, please. Sorry, just to add to that, we've been very fortunate that in the PR and comms industry generally, um, our members and non-members who use our products uh, are generally very tech savvy. Um, so often it's not been an issue for us, but at the same time, um, it's a very good point. Sally mentioned just there as well, access and, 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 and devices. We generally asked our members to give the feedback to, for example, if there is somebody who has any um, visual or sight issues and they can't use the platform, we ask them in advance, is there anything we can help them? So we have a human element, say if there's something that you're not able to see on the screen clearly, is there something we can do for accessibility or material? Um, if we need to send out material, we can still do that. So we do try and keep the options open for everybody. Um, it's not gonna be a, solution for all. We've encountered very little uh, IT or technology issues at the moment, but that's really just because of the, the end users. Um, but going forward, that might become an issue. 
but I think we're well geared to kind of provide alternative solutions for delivery there as well. So that hybrid approach, I think, can become a stronger blended approach going forward. Great, great. Thank you very much, Sushit. So um, I think we'll just do one more Q&A question because uh, we are overrunning, but there, there's so many. Um, and then uh, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll wrap up. As I say, we'll keep the conversation going after the meeting as well. So, uh, so please, uh, Rebecca, if you don't mind, one more. Yeah, absolutely. One that's just come in, actually. So how do you think online delivery will impact demand and attendance of residential learning? Oh, right. In a post-COVID world, mm, are we going absolutely. to be cannibalizing our own in-person <laughs> uh education uh, so yeah i'd like to uh, throw that one open then please i don't think so i think that i think naturally people do want to get back to some of the ways that we that we were used to working in i think um that won't ever disappear i think face to face there is still a very strong place for it um and particular as sally's been talking about within within healthcare and clinical settings, absolutely you need that. So I don't think it will go, but I do think we will continue with some of the, some of the different ways that we've, we've adopted as well. So I do think that we keep saying it, but I think this sort of hybrid model, I think will, will exist from now going forward. Um, but I, I don't think we have completely replaced face-to-face -face learning by any stretch. Does anyone think that there will be such uh, a preference for digital and remote and not having to get up and you know iron a shirt and so on um that actually the face-to-face -face might not be as successful as before and you might not do it is anyone thinking along those lines no i don't think so sorry i've dominated it. um i think when we've noticed for example with our just with our webinars in the last um few months numbers are good but numbers are dropping and i think there is that kind of fatigue of online that people are experiencing. We're all, you know, I think I'm sure we've all felt it ourselves as well. Um, you do need that variety. So I, I, you know, I think, I think it's here to stay. I think both are here to stay that there's a place for both depending on, on what you need to offer and what you have to offer. But uh, yeah, I, I think people do want to get back to some of the, the old ways that we used to work in, absolutely. Absolutely. Just building on what um, Jackie just said there, I think there's a there's a market now which is more emerging for international. So for digital, what it's been an enabler is for people who haven't been able to come to do a residential course in the UK face to face. Um, digital provides a new segment or an audience there, which we're very keen on. I uh, absolutely agree with Jackie and, and, and colleagues who have mentioned this, but I think I, mean, I saw it on the, the Q&A section there as well there is this fatigue of digital engagement um, and I think some people are now looking forward and I call it pent up demand I do think that we'll come back to a point where people would absolutely cherish coming back to do face-to-face -face, specifically in skills-based training because when they can learn from individuals in the room and apply that I think there's going to be a, a healthy economy for all going forward great great thank you um, the, uh, so it, it won't be uh, purely digital. The, it's very interesting that you use the word pent up. Um, there is a, a pent up appetite for in-person events, in-person conferences. Um, and uh, you know what at the minute looks like a giant Petri dish that we don't want to get into, uh, we're, but there is still this, this urge to get together and learn from each other in, in person. And, and I, think, uh, I think we would agree with that as, as what we're seeing at Heart Square. Although it's never to, I'm sorry about the cliche, it's never going to return to, uh, to how it was pre-COVID. Thank you very much, panel. Uh, I'm, really, uh, uh, I'm really grateful for, for that. Uh, and thanks very much for the audience as well for the huge number of uh, Q&A questions and chat. We will circulate responses uh, after the meeting. Uh, there were some really interesting threads that came out of, of that. First of all, that uh, the membership and education sector as represented by our panel, uh, who are living and breathing it on the ground, um, has had to be innovative, um, uh, creative uh, and responsive. Um, and as having done that, um, presumably after the initial spasm of March and April this year and paralysis, having done all of that has actually managed to turn uh, a crisis into a significant area of benefit 
uh, to their organizations and to their uh, and to their learners. So that's been uh, really interesting and impressive uh, to uh, to hear about. At the same time, uh, a large proportion of the audience are still struggling with systems that aren't allowing them to uh, to cope uh, with with data that's spread across too many uh, places and uh, therefore not able to to be as nimble and responsive as they would like to be because computer says no whenever they whenever they like to do things. Uh, but that is changing, uh, and 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 people are uh, seeing the the benefit of increasing investment in in that area. So great! I'll just like to wrap. I'm sorry we took a few minutes uh, over. It's uh, because of the number of Q and A questions and the quality of them. So I hope it's a good reason for everybody. Um, and I'd like to um, say thanks very much for attending our webinar, and particular thanks to uh, to the panel for making the time today. So thank you all very much. I'm uh, I'm, I'm really grateful, and I look forward to seeing you. Um, at our at our next webinar. Thanks thanks a lot everybody.